This is Toledo Symphony Lab, a behind-the-scenes look at the world of classical music from WGTE Public Media and your Toledo Symphony. I'm Brad Cresswell. I'm joined in the studio today by the TSO's principal second violin and artistic administrator, Marwin Sue. We also have a very special guest by phone. Let me bring him in with a little bit of a fanfare here. That is... That is violinist Randall Goosby, who's appearing with the symphony this weekend, a streaming concert. We're going to talk all about that. But first of all, I want to welcome you, Randall. Thanks so much for having me, Brad. How's it going? Going very well. So you're out in Virginia Beach right now. Um, This concert that is happening is going to be streaming uh, live as it happens. It'll also be available afterwards. You can find more information at ToledoSymphony.com. This has music by a remarkable figure of uh, the 18th century in France named the Chevalier de Saint-Georges. Joseph Boulogne was his name. Uh, I want to talk about him, but before we get to that, Randall, why don't we introduce you to our audiences? You are, of course, a violinist. Um, You won the Sphinx competition back in 2010. You won the Young Art Concert Artist competition. You're a a protege of Itzhak Perlman, who has incidentally been here in Toledo a couple of times. Um, I wonder if we could tell Randall's story. I'll bring up a little music and take us back beyond all of that, back to the beginning, and tell us a little bit about how the violin first came into your life. Let me pull this music up. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Randall's <laughs> right, story. Go. go for it. Great. Um, well, first of all, thanks so much for having me again. I mean, if I take it back all the way to day one, um, it was it was kind of a funny story. I mean, my mom uh, is of Korean descent, born and raised in Japan, so she's a, a native speaker of Japanese. It's her first language, and um, you know, music education is a is a much bigger deal, um, basically everywhere else in the world, <laughs> besides the U.S., <laughs> but especially in Asia. Um, and so, you know, having that knowledge and having been um, uh, an avid fan and, and music lover um, growing up, she wanted myself and my two younger siblings to be able to play an instrument. Um, she, instead of sort of just putting one in our hands, she asked the three of us what we wanted to play. And my younger brother and sister said they wanted to play piano. Perfectly, uh, perfectly fine choice. But for, for whatever reason, I said violin. Um, I don't mm-hmm. think we had had any conversations about it uh, until that point. Um, I, I really don't know why I said violin, nor does she. Um, I'm guessing I just heard it on the radio or I, you know, saw someone on TV doing it or something. And, you know, everyone, all, all the sort of young kids at that age, six and seven and eight, kind of want to, uh, you know, be a, be a pop star or be an athlete or something like that. And I guess, you know, I like to think I was thinking, uh, you know, I just want to do a little something different. Um, but, you know, she, she, sort of honored my, my request and took me to a music store and we went to go try and find a violin. Uh, but funny enough, the gentleman at the uh, counter there in Jacksonville, Florida, which is where we were living at the time, uh, he looked down at me, uh, looked at my mom, and he said, you know, he's he's a small kid. You know, he's how old is he? And she said, you know, I was six, going on seven. He was like, you know, his hands are kind of small. The violin is a very, very difficult uh, instrument to negotiate, let alone, you know, really, really master and learn how to play. And for that reason, a lot of young kids quit when they, uh, you know, shortly after they start the violin. Uh, so he recommended that, that I start on piano like, like my two younger siblings. And, uh, you know, I was, a little, I was a little down, but I guess, you know, just happy to be able to play an instrument. And um, it took about three months of piano lessons for me to just really look my mom in the eyes and say, hey, mom, I, I really want to play the violin. I mean... To me, as, as I remember it, the only reason I stayed with piano for, for, for that long is because my teacher uh, was so nice to give me Sour Patch Kids every lesson, no matter how badly I played. <laughs> nice. I, could miss, I, I, I could not have practiced the entire week, and I'd still get a little bag of Sour Patch. So that, came me, that, that kept me coming back. Um, but, you know, after a few months, I, my mom saw that I, was, that I was really, really, you know, sort of itching to play the violin and um, asked around, we found a Suzuki teacher, a uh, local Suzuki teacher in the area, and uh, that's kind of how it all started. Uh, it was it was it was really fun for me because I mean, first of all, I, I absolutely just couldn't put the violin down for for you know years after I started playing. I just I, I couldn't get enough of it, and I just loved the sound and being able to sort of express myself so freely on an instrument. Um, but all of my friends at the time, you know, who were all sort of doing different things, uh, they saw me. Um, 
they saw me sort of practicing the violin whenever they, they would come over to, to the house and uh, hang out. And shortly after, I started actually um, basically everyone in my in my uh, sort of sort of kindergarten first grade class at the time uh, ended up picking up the violin as well and my Suzuki teacher started coming into my school and giving group lessons to my whole class which which you don't really you don't really hear uh, that that kind of a story nowadays so that yeah. was a, that was just sort of the very beginning and uh, the rest is the rest is sort of in history I guess yeah that, that's I want Merwin to chime in here because because Merwin is you know obviously a violinist also but also a teacher of violin and, and has done a lot with you know on the other side of the aisle Merwin you were taking notes while Randall was telling us his story what, what do you got for us well I just find it so incredibly amazing that like you were able to kind of be the influencer for this entire generation of kindergarten first graders in Jacksonville and <laughs> I, I just think that's wonderful. Um, it's it's amazing because I think one of the things that we're very proud of at the TSO is that we actually have an affiliated symphony school of music. It started out as a, as a Suzuki school, um, mm-hmm. and it's bro- broadened out a little bit. But um, but it's it's very cool that you have those Suzuki roots, and I'm sure that our education department will be delighted to hear that, and maybe we'll try to work in a plug or something yeah. <laughs> Some, sometime in the next <laughs> week or so. I, I think if there's one thing that we can take away from Randall's story there, it's that to uh, never underestimate the power of Sour Patch Kids, right? It's, it, <laughs> Definitely. Halloween yeah. month. Yeah, you know, exactly. I mean, that, that, was, that, was, that was 16 years ago, and yeah. they pretty much still have the same effect on me. Sour Patch Kids in front of me, I'll pretty much do whatever you want. Good to know. It, it, w- is that in your writer? We'll put that in your dressing room, a, a bowl of Sour Patch Kids <laughs> for every performance. I certainly wouldn't have any complaints. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you were, uh, you know, if you were playing the trumpet or the clarinet or something that involved the mouthpiece, you probably wouldn't have been sucking on Sour Patch Kids. It, that seems like a, a particular violin uh, candy, violinist candy. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Let's not delve into that too much. <laughs> <laughs> we'll stay away from that subject. Okay, good to know. Uh, but Randall, let me ask you then, I mean, obviously you had this huge interest in playing the violin when you were young. It was a big part of your life. When did it occur to you that, hey, I'm going to do this for a living, right? Yeah. Um, well, it took several years, and it wasn't, it wasn't uh, you know, solely my realization. If anything, it was, it was my mom's, first and foremost. Um, I mean, I... I was, you know, by the time we had moved away from Jacksonville, I was, I was about, a, uh, I guess, going on 11, 11 or 12 years old, and um, obviously was in between teachers. Um, I was actually, you know, I didn't, I didn't do, uh, I didn't go through the Suzuki program for more than about a year. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it took me about a year to get through, I don't know, four books or something like that. Yeah. And my teacher at the time was like, "Wow, you're, that's, I wasn't expecting that. You know, I'm, I'm a pretty new teacher." Um, you know, I just, and, and I was lucky for her to have come forward and said this, which was that, I, you know, in, in your best interest, I feel like you would benefit more from having a, having a more experienced, uh, 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 teacher. I don't know if you want to stay with Suzuki or, or move in a different direction, but, you know, the stars aligned as they have many, many times throughout, uh, you know, throughout my, my sort of life and my musical growth. And, uh, we found a, a really, really amazing teacher, um, farther south in Florida in Daytona who was um, Latvian and, and sort of studied by way of the Russian school, as it's come to be known uh, within the music world. And she studied uh, with David Oistrock, actually, which, who was a huge, huge uh, inspiration and, and role model for me, especially in my younger days. Wow. Um, and so I spent three years with her at, at the end of our time in Florida, and we, we ended up moving to Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and shortly after that, you know, we, we had some trouble finding a teacher. And long story short, I landed at a music festival in Colorado, uh, and there I was sort of randomly assigned with, with, um, another excellent violinist there by the name of Philippe Quint. Uh, yeah. and I continued studying with him for, for several years. And I actually, because we were in Memphis and he, he was living in New York city at the time, my mother and I, um, somehow got ourselves to fly from Memphis to New York once a month for lessons. Mm-hmm. Um, so we would, we would fly from Memphis on, you know, it, it would usually be a Friday night or a Saturday morning. And um, I would have a three-hour lesson on Saturday. My mom would be there with the with the uh, video camera and the notebook, recording anything that uh, you know anything that would would be of note and would help me in my practice as I was able to look back on it. And uh, we'd go back to the hotel. I'd look at the notes or not, 
practice or not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then Sunday, uh, Sunday, I would go back to, to uh, Mr. Quinn's apartment and have another three-hour lesson before we, you know, uh, packed our bags and got back on the plane. So we did that every month. Um, and after about three years, that question that you asked sort of started to arise. Um, you know, after after a few years of pretty inconsistent lessons by by, you know, by normal standards, I mean, ideally, when learning an instrument, especially one as difficult as the violin, um, you know, you want consistency. You want weekly lessons. Yeah. But uh, considering that, you know, this is kind of the best option we had at the time, um, we just went for it for as long as we could. And there was one day I remember so vividly. I was, I was, I don't remember what I was playing, but I just remember, you know, being in this, you know, beautiful sunlit New York City apartment. Um, I guess I played maybe not so well, and um, Philippe with with you know no hard feelings or no ill intentions in mind I mean he really looked at me and he said is this something that you want to do is this something that you're enjoying is this um, you know is this something you you want to keep doing for a career uh, and I couldn't answer him I didn't really know you know I mean mm-hmm. uh, as 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 grateful as I am today looking back on those times you know as a as a 13 year old kid um, you're flying back and forth for six hours of lessons a month and then going home and just trying to have to you know, recollect and, and, you know, take the little nuggets of wisdom from the teacher on his own. You know, I, I, I didn't really ask for any of that. Um, I was certainly grateful for it, but you know, at the time when he asked me, I was like, man, this is, this is hard, you know, it's hard yeah. to, to retain all of this information and, and, and continue to grow and get better after only seeing your teacher for once a month. And, um, that led to Philippe recommending that I apply, uh, for the Perlman music program. And he said, you know, if there's anybody who can sort of guide you on, on next steps and, and perhaps lead you to a, to a more consistent, you know, uh, uh, study schedule, it's Doc Perlman. I mean, yeah. he's, he's the guy. He's the man. And so, um, you know, again, the stars aligned, and I, I somehow, you know, got into the program. I'm sorry, there's a plane going over here, and I hope that's not too loud. That's okay. I mean, it, I, it's just occurring to me, you're, you know, these names like Philippe Quint and, of course, Itzhak Perlman. I mean, you obviously were at a at, at a pretty high level at that point already to go into the uh, the Perlman program. Yeah, I mean, I I think for for my age, I mean, you know, even even today, looking back, and and, and even you know, as it relates to some of my friends and colleagues today, um, you know. I, I, I never thought of myself as, you know, in, in my house, we called it the P word. We didn't like to throw around the word prodigy yeah. uh, around the house as, as, as so much of media did, especially for, for a young person like, like I was. Um, you know, I, I, my parents are very, very humble people, and I, I've been raised to be the same. And, you know, I, I, I just like to think that, you know, the path that I was sort of destined to go down was the one that I was lucky enough to actually, you know, land upright on my feet on and just continue to continue to move um yeah. but uh yeah i mean i was very very lucky and i'll, I'll get back to your question as of you know when did i sort of know and it was that first summer uh that i attended the perlman music program i mean obviously i was you know i was a nervous wreck <laughs> you know, pulling up to the campus there on shelter island about to meet the greatest violinist who had ever lived and here i was this 13 year old kid i mean i didn't even i didn't have three or four concertos under my belt yet at the time and um I remember, and this is a pretty funny story, I, I remember pulling up to the campus and uh, dropping all my bags in my in my room, which which is where I would be staying for the next six weeks. I mean, it's a really, um, you know, intensive program over the summer and made my way to the cafeteria where everyone was getting lunch and where, you know, we would sort of have the group meeting to sort of get everyone on the same page going into day one of the festival. And uh, I walked up into the lunch line behind none other than uh, Maestro Perlman. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't know whether I was, whether I should say something. I mean, I was like probably four foot five holding this shaking, the empty lunch tray. And I was just like <laughs> thinking of something to say. And then I, I saw his, I saw his massive hand reach, reach, you know, over into the serving counter and grab this just pile of chicken nuggets and put it on his plate. <laughs> and instantly I was put at ease. I was like, oh my gosh, like he, he's got it. He understands me. You know, he gets it. He gets it. Yeah. It's all about the chicken nuggets. Um, <laughs> You went but, from uh, you Sour know, Patch to Chicken Nuggets then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I guess that's that's the sort of sequence of things, right? Yeah. Sour Patch at eight, Chicken Nuggets at, you know. <laughs> um, but anyways, you know, that, that, that was a really, really, I mean, incredibly inspiring is a, 
is 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 a huge understatement. I mean, I was that was the first time in my musical life by that point. I think I was 14, going on 15, when I was just surrounded by immense talent and passion and dedication of of kids my age and, and slightly older. Every week we would have student recitals where all the students would perform. And I mean, there were kids playing like the whole Sibelius concerto at like 15 wow. and, you know, these Vinyevsky caprices and all this just crazy hard stuff. And I was like, wow, this is what I, you know, this, this is what I can do with, with the violin. You know, it was all sort of ambiguous to me before I was like, why am I, what's, what's the need for all of this? And I, I was just immersed and everyone has the same, you know, real, deep love, not just for violin, but music in general. I mean, we'd have video nights where Mr. Perlman would put on some of his favorite recordings of, of singers and, and, and jazzers, you know, from, from different genres and everything. And we would all talk about it and he would sort of relate everything back to violin and classical music and how, you know, how we can sort of channel this artistic energy um, into making something that's, that's, that's really special and personal and, you know, not self-conscious and not competitive. I mean, it, it was just a, it was a haven. Um, yeah. for, for young kids like myself and like the rest of the students there. So that was the moment when I was like, wow, yeah, this is, I mean, I can't, I can't not do this after having experienced all of this. You know? Yeah. What so, a wonderful uh, experience. Yeah. Uh, it's Toledo Symphony Lab. We're talking with violinist Randall Goosby, who is uh, bringing a violin concerto by Joseph Bologna, the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, to the uh, Peristyle this weekend. That's going to be a streaming concert. You can find more information at ToledoSymphony.com. Uh, Randall, let's talk about the repertoire on this concert, and many people may not be familiar with the Chevalier de Saint-Georges. Um, it's a name that's getting a little more attention these days, but somebody who really, really deserves to have their story told because what a remarkable figure this person was. Can you tell us a little bit about him? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm learning more about him uh you know, every time I every time I sort of look his name up, I find something new. I mean, he was such an interesting guy, um, the son of sort of French nobility and the wife of one of the slaves of his father. Um, and so he was he was you know back in those days known as uh, I think I keep seeing the word mulatto, which is basically an illegitimate sort of mixed uh, mixed race person. And um, you know, like I said, I, I, I have a lot of reading up to do on his on his sort of biographical history, but you know, it's just so it's so crazy to think about this man who was a who was a, a fencing champion and a horseback rider and you know, essentially a, an elite athlete in that time. Um who, you know, we, we have a lot of documentation of those sorts of things that he did growing up and, and, and transitioning into adulthood. But as far as his musical education and who he studied with and how he got started and, you know, what, what sort of drove him into that field, there's not a whole lot of documentation, that, at least that I've found um, yet. Yeah. And so it's, it's really interesting to think about that while he was, you know, making a name for himself as a, as a center. I mean, he must have been, um, you know, engaged in music as well. I mean, we all know that music is not something you sort of pick up uh, as a, as a, as a, as an adult or even as a teenager in some cases and make a living out of it, let alone, you know, uh, develop the, the sort of reputation and gain the fame and success that he did in the time. Um, but it's really interesting to think about because as a mixed race person, you know, he's a son of nobility, but he was still mixed race and in a sense illegitimate because of his, uh, you know, his mother's, uh, having been a slave. And it's interesting to think about what sorts of things he may have been thinking about while, you know, receiving some of this treatment that comes to, you know, uh, the descendant of nobility, but at the same time being denied certain certain treatment and being being mistreated in certain ways because of the other half of his, yeah. of his heritage. Um, and it's something that's so, so prevalent and, and, and relevant today, as unfortunate as it is. And it's just crazy to think about, you know, what sorts of things he may have been putting into his music because of this sort of experience that he um, you know, that, that was his life. Um, so it's, it's been a really, really great time exploring just this one of, I mean, he wrote 14 or 15 violin concertos. I mean, really mm -hmm. prolific composer and, and really ahead of his time in terms of his writing style, uh, in terms of his technique. I mean, you see um, very, very fast-moving, athletic, high-reaching notes and passages uh, of notes, uh, you know, in the solo violin part. And I, I have told the story a number of times to a number of different people, but um, and you guys probably are well aware of this, but um, at the time when Mozart and his mother arrived in Paris, mm -hmm. sort of looking to looking to break out onto the scene, um, Mozart was taken in by 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 a duke or a baron of some kind at the palace of of Marie Antoinette in Paris, 
and they ended up actually living under the same roof for a couple of months. I mean, it's not known how closely, if, if at all, that they actually interacted face to face. But Mozart certainly got, um, you know, a little taste of Chevalier's music because he was directing the orchestra yeah. uh, at the time and he was performing all over the place. He was a big, uh, he, he was, the queen was a, Marie Antoinette was a big supporter of his. Um, and young Mozart, you know, was, was still in his teens. And I believe his mother passed away shortly after he arrived in Paris. Um, and so he was sort of, he was very, in, you know, in a very vulnerable state, probably, probably a little bit of jealousy considering that, you know, he, he probably understood what a great composer he was. And at that time he wasn't yet recognized for that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you see the influence of Chevalier's, you know, incredibly virtuosic style, uh, come into Mozart's music as, as early as, you know, a year after that period when they were supposed to have lived together. Um, specifically in the yeah, Mozart Symphonia Concertant for violin and viola, you know, that is, that is some, some real soloistic writing for Mozart there. I mean, both violin and viola are going up into the highest registers of the violin, um, specifically in cadences, which was a big thing that Chevalier uh, de Saint-Georges did, uh, did and was not done before him. You know, people sort of started to pick up that sort of high-reaching, virtuosic, athletic style. Yeah. Um, after he sort of did his thing. So it, it's just, it's crazy to think how influential um, someone like him could have been back then, considering all of the challenges that so many, that so many people of color face even today. Uh, well, so it's a very inspiring story and it's been, it's been great. It's a great experience. And I look forward to, you know, to studying and discovering more of his music and more about him. I, I always think of the symphony of concertante, like, you know, uh, Chevalier more or less invented that form and it was picked up by Mozart or copied by Mozart. You know, two soloists facing off against an orchestra. It makes me think of like a, a fencing uh, match. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, like maybe exactly, that's where exactly. maybe that's where the idea came from. So in the matchup between the violin and the viola, you know, which one wins, right? <laughs> I think I know what you would well, say. My- yeah. Well, my girlfriend is actually a violist, so I'm oh, okay. on that. <laughs> <laughs> you have to plead the fifth on that one. Yeah. Yep. 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 Well, let's talk a little more uh, about uh, the Chevalier de Saint Georges in, in the sense that you know he was such a fantastic, famous, acclaimed person. The French Revolution came along and kind of derailed some of his musical plans. He got involved in that. He led the first uh, all-black male regiment in in Europe on the side of the um, revolution, it should be said, even though he had been like a friend of Marie Antoinette and they were very close. And and you touched on the fact that he faced some racism during his time in Europe. Let's transport that to the 21st century in conversations that I know that you've had about difficulties and challenges that people of color who are musicians, who are composers, are facing today in the world of classical music, which is so dominated by these, you know, white male Europeans of centuries past. I know there's a lot to talk about, but maybe if you could just put it in context, because I know you've done a lot of thinking about this, give it, give it, what are the things that concern you the most about that situation today? Oh, man. I mean, the, I mean, to be honest, it, it's such a head spinning issue for me. I mean, it's one yeah. that I haven't had to uh, really come to terms with in my personal life until until quite recently. You know, in the past couple of years, and especially in the past few months, um, you know, in the wake of in the wake of so many countless you know murders of, of black people, uh, innocent black people, and it's something that I you know struggled with early on in the pandemic, thinking, okay, wait a minute what have I been doing to sort of better this cause? What have I even been thinking about in relation to this cause up until this point in my life? And, you know, I'm, I'm sort of trying to pick up the pieces a little bit and, and, you know, use the little bit of a platform that I have as a, as a, uh, you know, classical musician of all things to raise awareness on some of these issues. Um, you know, there have been a lot of panel discussions, a number of which I've been involved in, um, which are still available online. And, you know, a lot of them talk about, um, American orchestras specifically and how, you know, the selection process and the tenure process and the audition process and all of these things are a reflection of the sort of systemic, the systemically unjust systems that have been in place for so long. Um, and these are things again that I, that I, you know, they're not things that I've been thinking about my whole life yet at the same time, 
you know, there are so many conversations being had about it and there's so much, you know, uh, discourse and butting heads from both sides. Whereas, you know, for me, it's, it's, it, you know, it was a matter of thinking about it for a few days and being like, yep, I mean, it's wrong. There are things that need to change and, and there are people that don't want those things to change for, for whatever their reasons may be. And so, you know, for me as a musician and said many times as I was sort of recapping my, um, my sort of growing up in, in music and in life is I've been very, very lucky uh, from day one. I mean, things continue to align and the stars have continued to align for me. And I'm so, so, so grateful for that. I do not take it for granted. Um, and for that reason, you know, I feel, I feel a great responsibility and a great desire to give back in, in whatever way I can, you know, uh, yeah. raising awareness on some of these issues, you know, making uh, classical music that much more accessible for kids who, for whom it was not and still is not. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's one of my main focuses. I mean, for me, now the question that a lot of orchestras have is, okay, you want us to diversify. Where do we, where do we find these, these people that, that uh, you know, that can add you know, diversity and, and culture and richness to our organization? Um, and they're all over the place. They're all over the place. I mean, it's so discouraging for me to hear that. You know, where? Where do we look? I mean, are you looking is my question. Where yeah. are you looking? Um, and, and there's just there's such a breadth of, of talent and, and passion and just individuality uh, amongst everyone, of course. But, but people of color in particular in this country who have been, um, you know, denied access to a lot of the same opportunities that others uh, have been afforded with, with, with ease. And, and for me... I mean, I just, like I said, I, I, I feel like, you know, there's a reason that I'm in this position. There's a reason I've been so lucky for so long to have had some of these opportunities come my way. And now, you know, a great focus of mine is trying to de- devote a lot of energy uh, into giving back and into making sure that what I do and the art that I love so much is in service of something um, something meaningful and something just and something uh, that everyone can enjoy and have access to and pursue as a career if they so choose. Um, so that's been, a, that's been a, a big, big focus of mine and, um, you know, constantly looking at ways to, you know, incorporate that into everything I do. Well, I think it's absolutely wonderful that um, you're so involved in, and I think one of the things that's really problematic is that so, so many people sometimes turn to classical music as an escape from the world when you even, mm. when all you need to do is look at the Chevalier de Saint-Georges and his incredible involvement with the world around him and how that right. kind of permeates his music. And I think this sense that, you know, that somehow classical music can exist as an island completely separate from the world around you is just, it feels very naive, particularly at this point. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, you know, I've been trying to figure out ways where, you know, everyone's saying, this is, you know, the Eurocentric field, obviously, I mean, much, many of the giants of classical music are, um, you know, dead, and they lived in Germany. (laughs) And, um, you know, I'm trying to figure out ways to, you know, look into and research the history of the influence and the, and the, and the, the importance of black people in classical music. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, we talk about Chevalier de Saint George. I mean, there's the story that, that's, that's now getting a lot more press about, um, the Bridge Tower Sonata, otherwise known as the Kreutzer Sonata of Beethoven, which right. was originally dedicated to, to George Bridge Tower, a black violinist, contemporary and friend of Beethoven's. Um, and it's these stories, it's these, um, you know, these influences that, that I think would do the whole industry, I mean, a great, a great service. I mean, it's been a disservice that they've been unnoticed and sort of uh, erased from history for so long. But, um, you know, for people to, like you said, uh, 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 Merlin, for people to say things like, you know, classical music is blind. It's, it's, you know, it doesn't see race. It doesn't see color. It's not about that. Um, unfortunately, it has been about that for a long time. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's just in ways that many of us, you know, haven't had to reckon with and uh and really look into so i mean it's been a big priority of mine and not only is it you know doing a service to 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 the industry and doing a service to all of the people who um you know have something to gain and something to learn and something to uh, something to uh, be inspired by uh with these stories but it's also i mean it's beautiful music as you'll hear mm-hmm. uh you know at the concert it's just it's it's spectacular i mean it's so revolutionary especially considering the time that he was in the circumstances he was living under um, it's just nothing short of inspiring, and I, I can't wait to, to discover more of his music and learn more of his music, but also, um, you know, educate myself and, and study and discover 
more of these of these prolific black figures in classical music um, that far back. I mean, these days we're seeing a resurgence, not a resurgence, a surge um, of of contemporary black composers and black mm-hmm. musicians. Uh, right. And we're learning about people like Grant Still and mm-hmm. Florence Price, uh, Coleridge Taylor Perkinson, um, who really, in the grand scheme of things, are quite recent. Mm-hmm. Um, but going back, you know, that that that's where I'm really really curious to see to find out, you know, what what have what have sort of my my ancestors and descendants done for this art form that I love so much because I know that it's more um than than the story that is that is told today so um as as difficult as it is to to hear um some people's views on these things and see what's going on in the news and see you know all, all of this just negative energy uh flowing all over the place um I feel that this is a great opportunity um, to sort of get back on the right track, you know, and to figure out really what's what's important, figure out what um, you know what voices need amplification and 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 help getting out there due to the due to the systemic nature of of uh, you know there being silence for so long. So, you know, it's it's quite a dichotomy. But me being me, I mean, I try to stay as positive as I can and mm-hmm. see the light in every situation I'm in. And, uh, you know, this is just a great way uh, for me to channel some of that, some of that energy and some of that creativity. And I can't wait uh, to come and share with, with the people of Toledo. I was wondering if, I mean, I know that it's, there's some amazing contemporary um, black composers, but I, but I loved the fact that you were kind of thinking about the kind of the history of how, how when we tell the story of, you know, and I, I'm putting canon in like quotation marks, you know, there's these kind of these influences and currents that just have not been brought forward enough. And maybe, you know, as we kind of reach the end of this program, are there a couple of voices from the 19th century, for instance, that you think, oh, these are these are people that we should be listening to. These are people that we should be amplifying. Well, I mean, I'm just making discoveries myself. Okay. I mean, I, I, I um, you know, I, I, this isn't 19th century, but I mean, you talk about people like, like Grant Still and Florence Price, mm-hmm. the people that I yeah. mentioned, uh, you know, just a few minutes ago. I mean, these are these are figures that you know I played a, a suite by Grant Still on a on a recital program of mine that I took around the country uh, just a year ago. Wow. And nine times out of ten, you know, I would actually ask the audience, who, has anyone heard of Grant Still? Mm. And, you know, I mean, sometimes yeah, I was I was very happy to have seen a few hands go up in the audience. But otherwise, I mean, he's he's a he's an unknown, you know, and mm-hmm. and he is to me, I mean, one of the one of the biggest trailblazers in the name of, of, of uh, or in the way of black composers and black classical musicians. And for him to be so, um, you know, underrepresented and underrecognized is just a testament to, to, to the work that we have to do and to, mm-hmm. to the discoveries that we have to make. Uh, rather the rediscoveries, the unearthing uh, of these stories that are that are that are so um, important to the history of classical music. Yeah. Um, and so, like I said, I mean, I, I'm so excited. I mean, I, I'm very lucky to uh, be busier than I <laughs> might have expected during this crazy, you know, shut down time. But you know, in the time that I do have um, to sort of sit down and just and and read a little bit and 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 find out more about the, about the history of all these guys, men and women, and women, um, over time is is something that really excites me. We've been speaking with violinist Randall Goosby, who is coming to the Peristyle this weekend, bringing the music of the Chevalier de Saint-Georges, which will also be paired with a Mozart symphony that's happening uh, this weekend. Again, it is a, a streaming live concert. You can also order it to watch at your leisure after the fact. For more information at ToledoSymphony.com. I want to thank both Merwin Sue, who is in the studio with me today, and of course, violinist Randall Goosby for joining us. This program is a production of WGTE Public Media in collaboration with our sponsor, the Toledo Symphony, with generous support from the Rita Barber Kern Foundation. You can download episodes of our program as a podcast by going to our website at wgte.org slash lab. You can also subscribe to us through your podcast app of choice, including Apple and Google Podcasts. Don't forget to check out all the upcoming events at the Toledo Symphony. You can visit their website, toledosymphony.com, and their various social media outlets on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can find all of the TSO's streaming concerts online at stream.artstoledo.com. I'm Brad Cresswell. You've been listening to Toledo Symphony Lab from FM 91.